But in printed typography, we have to be that much more mindful of potentially anyone who's going to be reading this and the fact that it will exist in the world forever. So maybe there's even a little bit more pressure to make very kind of strategic and well thought out design choices up front. But if we just open our eyes and kind of observe and see like what works, what doesn't, what do I like, what do I not like, what is legible or readable or like trying to understand the world mm -hmm. around us through the mm -hmm. lens of typography to me mm -hmm. is fascinating. Hey typographer, maybe your main focus is on digital like mine and then the permanence of print can be a bit intimidating. This is why I wanted to invite Diana Varma today. Diana Varma is a print specialist with a passion for typography, an educator and writer for the graphic design industries. She is somebody I discovered through her podcast Talk Paper Scissors, which I really love and it's already 130 episodes and more out there. So this is alone amazing. I really appreciate the series of an incomplete history of type that she's sharing there with a lot of nice insights if you're not familiar with them. But from our conversation today, we want to focus on print and what you can learn if you want to get started with this or have an assignment maybe. In this conversation, we cover the advantages of print over digital in some situations, what readability and legibility are, and what font sizes work best in print. Also, Diana shares what's the smallest possible font size to print, which just blew my mind. You will learn how you can avoid beginner's mistakes in pre-press, also how to best print great text, which isn't that easy. Also, accessibility is a subject that always comes up during our conversation and Diana shares how she doubled down on her podcast because her Zoom fatigue students needed an option to learn off screen, which I really appreciate. So without further ado, let's jump right into our conversation and welcome Diana Varma. Thank you, Oliver, for all of those kind words. That's uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I love creating content around these nerdy, glorious topics. And so I am excited to uh, add a little bit more to the pool today. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Just for a beginning, where are you based out of from? Just north of Toronto, Ontario, Canada, but more specifically in my daughter's closet. <laughs> With dogs at my feet. That's where I am located today. Yeah. <laughs> That's the home office life, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah, the clothes life. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> uh, what got you infected with the typographic virus? Or when did the typographic bug bite you? Mm -hmm. So I went to school for this topic, believe it or not. So uh, my, my undergrad education uh, many moons ago now was in really in print specifically. So it's a bit of a niche program that I'm now teaching in today, but it's really kind of everything to do with print. But as part of that, we understand the whole workflow and we learn the whole process. So part of that was typographic education back in 2004 when I started. And it's kind of, I, I love type and I love books and I love reading and I love exploring what typography has to offer. So when I moved into the working world after graduation, I worked for a book printer and I got to get my hands on all sorts of beautiful type and, and get to see it all kind of come to life in print. And then uh, one thing led to another, led to another, and I had an opportunity to actually teach one of the courses that was similar to when the one I took in 2004. Uh, and, and I just kind of ran with it. And I love, love, love this topic of type. I now have the great opportunity to teach two different typography courses in, to our undergraduate students. And it's the best. Like, how much fun is this playing with letters all day? And I... I yeah. Absolutely uh, love teaching my little ones too. So I have a, an almost six-year-old and a three-year-old and it's so much fun to play with letters at their level. And then I get to go to my day job and play with letters at a different level. But really it's, it's, it's all just fun and the same thing. So cool. that's, that's the long and the short of it. Cool. Uh, so your, your main occupation is being an educator. Yes. 
Okay, yes. oh, that's brilliant. It's it's beautiful also to yeah light the fire for typography in others then hopefully mm -hmm. to, to to continue with it. Yeah, that's beautiful. You and um uh, you and I studied approximately around the same time. I started studying in 2005 in Austria. Yeah. And yeah. my 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 course was more focused around um, corporate design, classic graphic design. Not uh, it was also a bit of digital, but it, it was me something like both. We they haven't really made up their minds yet, and um, I, I I really loved also doing print stuff. But I moved more towards digital in the recent 10, 15 years. And actually, I also started out with digital. So this is something that is a bit nearer to my heart. But I always appreciated the haptics of paper and picking something mm -hmm. very special and interesting. And also in on your podcast, I heard a lot about very, very techy details and a lot oh, yeah. terminology <laughs> that's Th um, let's say intimidating in German and even more so if it's not your mother tongue. <laughs> That's fair. And so just to give you a bit of context about that. So during the pandemic, I came off of a mat leave, a maternity leave here with my youngest one. And I was given this new typography course that I had never taught before. And I really wanted to get ahead of, of kind of the Zoom fatigue, as it were, students yeah. coming to kind of video classes where the materials presented in a really, um, some would say engaging or dynamic way virtually, but there's still, there's a lot of it, just a lot of sitting, watching someone talk. Yeah. So I thought, how could I get ahead of this? And so I had started the podcast probably nine months or 10 months earlier. And I thought, ooh, wouldn't it be good to create this lecture content? And some of it is very technically heavy. <laughs> so this yeah. lecture content that students would be able to, uh, instead of hearing me sit in front of a screen and, and watch me, they could take me for a walk. And I encourage students to go out and walk and listen and cool. learn the content that way. So it was in lieu of traditional kind of lecture material or, or lecture setting that these podcasts were born. So the very highly technical ones were mm -hmm. actually uh, written and and recorded for those students. But I'm so glad that that uh, wonderful people like you also have a chance to kind of listen into the, the geekery because that's exactly what it yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, I also really enjoy on your podcast that you give others the opportunity to share their knowledge. You invite former students in that talk about their experiences in the work field. And I also really, as I said, like your series, An Incomplete History of Type, where I always learn something new, of course, um, from, from <laughs> these classics. And, and they're very concise and very well written. <laughs> you, you kind of also gave the, your students the spotlight in the latest season where they explain and show a typist, which is very cool. So they also get one feed into the waters of the content creator economy, mm -hmm. let's say so. So I also appreciate that a lot since it's a very useful skill later on if they want to promote their work and themselves. So kudos to you for that. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's been really fun. And uh, and Oliver, can you just kind of follow me around everywhere and be my hype person? Like this is <laughs> this is very kind of you. Like <laughs> my ego yeah. doesn't fit in this this office anymore after talking to you. So, no, I, I really appreciate your your support. It's It's been really fun. Yeah, no, the thing really is, um, that's the weird, when you follow somebody along, you have this weird thing of uh, asynchronous intimacy going on. where they <laughs> <laughs> Right? That's, that's yeah. a funny way to put it, but you're yeah, right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you know them a little bit better after yeah, hearing yeah. them so much. And it's just weird from the other, where, where did you get this information from? <laughs> Actually, from you, from one episode. <laughs> really, I said that. Well, yeah. So that's always that's fun. Funny. So, but when it now comes to print and typography... Um, mm -hmm. As we also said, you're as a specialist for print. Would you say that there's still something with all the possibilities that we nowadays have in digital typography with mm -hmm. all this high resolution, this flexibility, variable fonts that can be animated and moved and stuff. Would you say that there is something that we as digital typographers still could learn from print typography and also what we maybe then, what, what still works better on paper compared to screen? Yeah, this is a great question. I love paper. 
well, the name of my podcast is Talk Paper Scissors. I I love paper. I love print. I love everything about holding something in your hand and being able to to really enjoy it in real life and it not be a digital device. But I think there's a couple of things that that kind of um, still work better for printed typography versus digital. So I think the the first one is just its permanence. The fact that it will exist in the world theoretically forever or forevermore. And it kind of has to stand the test of time. So where on a digital device, I'm thinking specifically in e-readers, because I come from the world of books, that's what I kind of know best. But I'm thinking of of like EPUB technology and the fact that the reader has the has the kind of autonomy and authority to choose the size, to choose the typeface, to choose even the contrast level of type to the the screen. And so a lot of those decisions can be made, obviously, by the user. But in printed typography, we have to be that much more mindful of potentially um, anyone who's going to be reading this and the fact that it will exist in the world forever. So maybe there's even a little bit more pressure to make very kind of strategic and well thought out design choices up front. And then I think another thing that that works really well in print is its tactility. So not mm-hmm. so in thinking of the inside of a book, I mean, yes, there's the tactility of paper and like the the beautiful way that that a book smells. I mean, that's that's the best thing ever. But I'm thinking more to do with the cover design, for example. So you have um, not every cover is uses kind of special coatings and materials, but many do. And so all of a sudden you have this 3D element to your type mm-hmm. that that doesn't exist, can't exist in the same way yet in digital, where you feel this kind of shiny or matte or textured layer literally mm. sitting on top of the type, which brings it to life and catches your eye as you're walking by walking mm. by um, uh, an end cap or something in a bookstore. So I think that mm. still really, that works um, beautifully in printed type. And then I, I think the last thing is really just its simplicity. So the fact that you aren't looking on a backlit screen, that you can bring this book or whatever you're reading this type to the beach or to the I don't know you can shove it in your bag and look at it on the subway or or whatever mm-hmm. the case is but it's just kind of its simplicity in its existence you don't have to it's not battery powered it's easier on your eyes in a lot of ways because you're you're um it's not a backlit screen so i i still think that type in print there's a lot of a lot of pros, a lot of opportunity for innovation, a lot of, um, a lot of benefits to printed type. Mm, yeah, yeah. Let me unpack that for a second. I mm-hmm. really like the part with the mindfulness, since um, when we ca- when it comes to making decisions, typographic decisions, and also design decisions with a website right. or an app or something, you always can have back in mind. Yeah, we can redo this. It's mm-hmm. not so much of an effort, and um, definitely you have to make more conscious decisions and also more impactful decisions when it comes to something being materialized after your yeah. uh, design process definitely but i think this would be also helpful in a lot of cases because even though if we would change things especially the typography in digital uh, projects in apps or websites or user interfaces mm-hmm. even then it has a big effect on everything since the text might be the foundation for everything and then it also comes with a lot of effort redoing stuff and things might not look that refined not guaranteed but it could so i think this could be helpful as well and regarding the accessibility part that's true definitely i always think about um pictures when uh, somebody takes a pictures you won't find uh, the old phones on the attic and then take a look at it (laughs) in 200 years or something and it won't work that way if you haven't printed something physically out there it's in one way it's it's not that accessible if it's physical because you can't share it that easily right Mm -hmm. now which is then an advantage when it comes to accessibility right now with digital But w- for the long game, I think there the accessibility might win. Do you do you have any experience about hybrids and and and, and stuff like that? Maybe. 
Oh man, that's a good question. I, this isn't really super type relate. Well, it kind of is. So in thinking about, so my mom is a genealogist. She is like a family history, she's our family history buff in our family. So she's very, (laughs) very involved in, in family history. So we have the good fortune, speaking of photographs, like we have a lot of photographs that are 100, 150 years old, um, almost that are still intact that exist physically. So I've, this is something that I've thought about in relation to books and to mm-hmm. type and to preserving our own kind of family history, as it were. So that's actually what I do is I create these, I call them yearbooks, but they're family yearbooks that pull together stories from our family, type and and uh, and photos and, and different kind of mementos. And then uh, we print one up at the end of each year. So we have this kind of growing collection. But and thinking about a project specifically like that, um, we also have, I guess there's also an opportunity to, um, many, many, many years ago, I set up email addresses, for example, mm-hmm. for my my girls when they were little. And I haven't done it mm-hmm. in recent years, but I would send them emails when they were babies and, and be like, I hope you get this when you're 18 type thing, right? And so there's there's actually email addresses and and links to digital photos and stuff that I've kind of Easter eggs I've been sending them along the way that hopefully <laughs> connect them back to digital. So it's a little bit kind of over here in terms of talking type, but I think there are absolutely ways that we can kind of bridge or make the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Current digital accessible content, assets, whatever that is, type, and then also thinking about the future. I don't know. I I don't know. Yeah, that's good. Ah, oh, it's such a nice idea sending them. I I actually only write them a letter by hand once a year. <laughs> that's a great idea too, though. I feel like more. I feel like if Gmail ever ceases to exist, all of my my content yeah. will just uh, disappear. But yeah. definitely, yeah. I, I, let's hope not. I don't think so. <laughs> in 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 the near future, at least not. Yeah, it's true. So, it's true. Yeah, to print and type again. What do you think should you pay attention to now when you make a decision for a type choice when it comes to books or long reading formats in print? Two things you want to think about. So there's legibility and readability. So legibility, just to kind of refresh everyone's sure. um, memory, if you're if you're not sure, really has to do with the design of the letter forms, right? So how legible we're thinking, if we're thinking graffiti, super scripty, super ornate, not super legible, you don't want to read a book that is set in some sort of graffiti type. That would be painful. <laughs> um, but then we think of kind of the opposite of that as being a typical sans serif let's say a times new roman something that is very recognizable something that where the characters are we inherently understand what those letter forms are and what they should look like and and they're very legible well i guess coming back to accessibility for a second and legibility if we're choosing typefaces with for long documents especially with accessibility in mind we want to choose something that's familiar that's the big Mm -hmm. one so when we think of accessibility it comes down to familiarity I mean, there's lots more that kind of plays into that, but familiarity is one. And also just choosing um, typefaces, again, if we're thinking legibility, we're thinking accessibility, we're thinking long documents, typefaces that have characters that are distinct from one another. So the Bs aren't a perfect mirror reflection of the Ds, Ps and Qs, same thing. There's a bit of variation or there should Mm. be. And then thinking of like Is and Ls and the number ones. So those Mm. types of of, uh, characters, ideally those glyphs should be all unique. So that's legibility. If we're thinking about readability, that has to do how with ultimately how we set the type. So it's not the design of the individual letter forms, but it's how we what we do with the type that we're given and that makes it readable or not. Um, so a few things that we can do, certainly for printed books, printed long documents, yeah. choosing a serif typeface is going to okay. give weight to our baseline, right? And mm-hmm. it's going to allow our eyes to to follow that that baseline, the line, the invisible line that all of the letters sit on. Mm-hmm. that much more easily. So choosing yeah, choosing a serif typeface for long documents is often a very good idea for that reason. And then in terms of things like if we're talking readability and typeface choice, size is another big one. So body copy anywhere between 8 
to 12 points. If you're thinking about accessibility, it might be uh, a little bit larger than that. So you might be mm -hmm. anywhere from 12, 14, 16, 18 points even. So that, that mm. um, could change. And then also things like line length, right? Things we don't necessarily think about with type or choosing a typeface, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. ultimately it absolutely affects readability. So um, the optimal line length for accessibility, and really I would say everyone, because accessible design is good design ultimately, is between 45 and 90 characters is what mm. the studies have shown us. Mm. So, and that includes spacing characters as well. So it's all of these like different pieces. It's not just choosing one typeface. It's choosing a typeface that ideally is recognizable. The letter forms are recognizable, distinct and unique, mm. but also setting them in a way that that allows them to be easily read, thinking about mm. marking and spacing and sizing and all of these different pieces. So it's mm. that's a long, long winded answer to it depends is the really <laughs> it's really <laughs> or it's it's yeah. not the typeface choice, it's what you do with it. Yeah, sure, definitely. I didn't hear was the thing with the serifs and the baseline, which is interesting to me. Mm. I didn't hear about that one. Yeah, but makes sense kind of since it's the end stroke of the letter and then you can more clearly see on what line it might be. Um, what is a big advantage, I think, when it comes to line length and line height and font size is that you have this advantage that you have a static document. <laughs> You really mm. can decide for the line length and for the line height for that one state your document document will be in compared to mm. responsive web design where have this problem with and right. if it's a very narrow column, then you need less line height, obviously, since otherwise your text might fall apart and you will swipe and scroll forever. And right. if it's a, a very on a desktop de a device, you definitely want to have a max width for your container with your text, as you mentioned, around this 45 to 90 characters or something like that. And then there you need a little more line height because the way from the end of one night to the beginning of the next one might be longer so this will be beneficial as you said from print design when you can really choose a specific yeah. size and uh, speaking of size you said 8 to 12 points mm -hmm. there's always the thing with points and pixels are those the same mm -hmm. uh, so I am not an expert <laughs> I should say I'm not an expert uh, in the in the digital side really and and I love hearing you talk about the fact or, or the way line length kind of translates into digital um, the digital design world but pixels and points what I will say is they they are not the same they are related. I don't want to get into the technicalities because I might yeah. get it wrong because I just I don't yeah. know 100 percent. But what I will say is if you are designing books for print, really points are all that you need to know, all that's relevant. Right. A yeah. point is one seventy second of an inch. Uh, and then if you're thinking about designing books, again, coming from my my world of, of book design, if you're thinking about designing books for digital, then really you're creating EPUB format or EPUB documents from InDesign, for example, still yeah. points are the only thing that really kind of oh. matter in your design process. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. it's the answer is um, good question. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's good. But yeah, just if you come from a digital background and then you know, yeah. okay, sixteen pixels, this would be an, a, a decent uh, font size on a website or something always depending on the typeface again but if you print at 16 points it would be horribly large on paper yes uh, yeah exactly. I, I also saw that when when i did um, um, print design back then and um, then you kind of get familiar with okay let's you shouldn't go below six points you really shouldn't <laughs> and even then you should space it out and use a sturdy typeface and stuff like that and you shouldn't uh, go above 12 pixels for most typefaces for body text since then it would become very dull and very yeah too large basically from a, a, a technical perspective though interestingly enough in in excellent conditions under the right conditions for print in an offset lithography uh, printing environment we can actually print as small as one point type no way no yeah. way really yeah. how large yeah. is that 
uh, very small, one seventy second of an inch. I don't know, but it's it's so what you see, you don't see that very often. Um, maybe it's encoded subliminally in what you're reading. You just can't really see it uh, with your naked eye, but you see it a lot in pharmaceuticals, for example. So inserts that go into a pharmaceutical package, like into one a one point. A sorry, I, I'm just blown yeah, away. So 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 one point. Uh, again, that's under like optimal conditions, but you might see two or three or four points in certain situations in, uh, and again, pharmaceuticals, whether in packaging or in, for example, magazine design. And you could even see that in like, I don't know, disclaimers when you're, yes, you have okay. an ad for, again, pharmaceuticals comes to mind <laughs> and you have the teeny, teeny, tiny type at the bottom as disclaimer. Um, of course, there's, there's legal ramifications if that teeny tiny type doesn't print uh, and you can't actually read it, but it, it's possible. It's doable. Oh, that's, that's insane. Then Diana, you, you just blew my mind. I thought this was just because it's there at one point. Yeah. But nobody ever, I think when it comes back to tra traditional typography, I think I'm not sure in, in metal type, I think six points or something was the smallest you could get. That sounds right. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. know, but that, that, I mean, you'd have a hard know. time carving yeah. away at or or creating metal type <laughs> that's that's that small true true absolutely yeah. yeah do we see mistakes that are often make made from people that come from digital since it's so much more accessible to do design in today and then they print stuff out and they are disappointed and and, and don't know why so some some tips when it comes to type and coming from the screen mm -hmm. yeah there's a couple of things that come to mind so there is a little swatch in illustrator Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe in InDesign as well. Yeah, it should be. Um, that is called registration. So mm -hmm. I don't know if it's different in German. I'm assuming your interface is in German, is it? It is. Okay, I don't know what the I don't know what it'd be called if it's the same thing. Yeah. But it is. Um, I think that should be under like lock and key because what registration means? It looks like a black swatch, mm -hmm. and you can't delete it. It's mm -hmm. it's permanently affixed there mm -hmm. with the square brackets and in InDesign. Mm -hmm. But what, what that is, is it's four colors. So you've got 100% black, 100% cyan, 100% yellow, 100% magenta. So you mm -hmm. have 100% of all four colors. Really, this is to be used to create, to quickly create um, registration marks. If you're creating manual marks in mm -hmm. InDesign, for example, mm -hmm. you could quickly apply that registration swatch for four color printing, and you've got all four colors in a line on top of each other. Great. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> if someone who is new to the world of, of using these, these software programs sees registration, sees paper is typically the next one, or white, and then black, and they interchange registration for black because the swatch both look black, you're going to have a lot of problems with type um, because what's happening is you don't just have a single color now uh, and your, your type is not just that one color, typically black for mm -hmm. contrast purposes, but it's going to be made up of all four colors. And what that means is that it's nearly impossible to register on press. It's going to look blurry. It's going to give the illusion of it being out of focus or out of mm -hmm. register. And it's just a waste of money and time. And I mean, no, um, no self-respecting long document printing company will ever okay those files and send them to print yeah, with definitely. all four colors. Yeah. Like it, yeah. it'll be flagged in pre-press or yeah. pre-media, but, but that can be something that's easily avoidable. If you avoid the registration swatch, it is not black. <laughs> it is black and also three friends, cyan, okay. magenta, and yellow. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, oh, that's a good tip. That's a good tip. I think that's a beginner's mistake, a, a common one. Another mistake. So going back to the four color thing or, or using more than one color to set type. So there are opportunities certainly to incorporate color into our mm -hmm. typesetting adventures, mm -hmm. but we want to be careful not to incorporate too many colors for the same Can't reason. Can't we take any kind of color, Diana, for our typefaces? No, don't do that. <laughs> so ideally again if this is so if you're designing for digital if you're designing for the web yeah. have fun go crazy uh, it does not matter it does not matter for print we have a very finite resource which is a printing press and we if there are more than i'll say two colors so 
In printing, we have four process colors I've already mentioned, cyan, magenta, yellow, black, C-M-Y-K. K K stands Mm -hmm. for key color. So cyan, magenta, yellow, black. You want to have ideally no more than two of those represented within a single letter form, let's call it. Mm -hmm. So if you had some sort of purpley color, okay, we could do that by using yellow and Magenta. That took me a second there. I had to think. No. <laughs> but yeah, yellow and magenta. Does that actually create? No, that creates orange. Yellow oh, and magenta. I need to go yeah, back to cre- kindergarten. I need to go back. My kids are really good at color theory. Me, not so much, apparently. Really? But anyway, oh, awesome. uh, yeah, they, they're at a stage right now. It's really fun, actually, where they want to be very specific about how they name colors. So they'll pick up a purple crayon, be like, this is not purple. What is this, mom? I'm like, Violet? They're like, okay. What is this? <laughs> Lavender? What is this? This is aubergine? I don't know. And Lilac. They're very, <laughs> yes, they're very specific. But um, all is to say, no more than two colors, ideally, especially if you're using small type. Mm-hmm. If it's something really expressive and really interesting and really large, for example, in a magazine editorial spread, you're doing something creative and big and kooky, fine. Mm. You could use all four colors and and really experiment, but smaller type for registration purposes on press, the two colors aligning on top of one another, no more than two, please. Please, Okay, yeah. So you can split up your colors between cyan, magenta, yellow, and key, Uh, but you should only use two of them since then, as you said, for registration, when you print something, they could be misaligned and it also depends on the rasterization, I guess, and uh, how how fine the resolution of the the printing press then will be um, regarding the or the method of print, I guess, and then you will have a smooth um, uh, typeface or you won't. Look at you. You know so much about print. I'm just Talking rasterization? No, it's good. <laughs> it's good. And I was going to say the last one, though, last kind of tip I have here yeah. is if at all possible, use 100% of whatever color okay. you're working in, if possible. Ah, okay, okay. Because yeah, because, and I actually only learned this recently, which was kind of <laughs> embarrassing to, to, to say, but I... Now everybody um, knows, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the, the thing that, that you want to do, so instead of, if, if, for example, you have 100% black, that's very common, right? Mm. 100% black type that you're sending to print. That, when it is rasterized, when we are converting in the printing world, when we're converting from pixels to dots that will be printed on press... It's actually going to, or dots or lines, that that type is going to stay clean lines. It's going to look like the Bezier curves that, that they were designed in when it's on screen. Mm-hmm. If you bring that, that color level from anywhere under 100%, so 99 or below, mm-hmm. the technology that turns pixels to dots for press mm-hmm. is going to turn that text into dots. It's going to turn it into halftone. So what you're going to get is the illusion of a slightly fuzzy, not quite as crisp uh, yeah. line of, of type. So that, yeah, I don't want to get too technical, but if you can keep all of your type at 100% of, <clears throat> excuse me, whatever color you're working in. Yeah, let's tie a bit into that because um, I think what I discovered as a student and stuff and technology has advanced definitely, but um, when you print gray text, for example, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you want to print pr- gray text. And most of the time you might print it digitally since you don't have a lot of um, ec- um, yeah, pieces you want to print out. But then when you use, as you said, 50% black or something, it will become very um, yeah blurry or rasterized since the yes. rasterization, I think, in digital is not that fine compared to offset printing or something like that. But you would even get that in offset because that's what we're printing. Okay. If you're looking okay. at offset, yeah. uh, an offset um, yeah. print using a loop or a magnifier, you're going to look at it and be able yeah. to see that, that that gray text, that 50% gray, is just black ink printed in half of the area. Mm-hmm. So it's not like it's lightening its color. It's not like it's it's a, that we're applying yeah, this yeah. gray film. We're applying yeah, black sure. dots, but the dots are not taking up as much space. So when... We look at yeah. um, we look at the the print from with our naked eye. It gives the illusion of gray. Of, it's all just okay. an illusion. Yeah. Illusion, like like Nothing the posters. Is real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I heard one tip. Uh, maybe you have some ideas on that uh, back at school. Maybe it's not a good tip. Maybe it was the hot new shit from 20, uh, 2005 <laughs> or something. <laughs> that, you, that when you print a gray mm -hmm. tone in digital or something, you could, let's say, for example, not using 60% black, you could use, let's say, 20% cyan, 20% magenta, 20% yellow, 20% key. Okay, your face turns horribly, so I guess it's not a good so, so, I mean, could you try it and test it and see if it looks any better? Maybe. My guess is it's it's any complexity you add into the, the front end in terms of color, I think mm -hmm. it's going to... I don't know that it's going to solve the problem because you're still printing using dots okay. now you just have different colors in the mix and digital is different in the sense that you're not having the colors register on top of one another very seamlessly in most cases so it's not the same problem where you have a physical press operator who's who's making sure these colors sit on top of each other but i don't know that that's going to solve your problem i would say if you want gray text reduce your um your percentage of black Okay, fifty percent or anywhere in there. And could be, there be anything else? Maybe um, how I could get a crisp gray text without no. No, <laughs> no okay. there is a way. There is a way. So you could use a Pantone color, right? So you okay, could yeah, a solid color then. Exactly. So you would yeah. you would set your text uh, using let's say it's Pantone. I don't know what the the number would be, but it's gray. The color is gray in the Pantone library, yeah, yeah. and then uh, you can choose that color swatch in InDesign or Illustrator. Set it to one hundred percent. Okay. And yeah. then it will. Um, but then you're going to pay a lot extra for. Yeah. Uh, for the the extra time that it takes to set up that unique color on the time on press, you're going to pay yeah. for the actual special color itself or someone to mix that special color on site at the press shop, print shop. Okay. So yeah, just use okay. black text. It's, it's more accessible too. <laughs> It's it's better. It's better for everybody. Black text on a on a white page. I only use Helvetica Light in four points on uh, in, <laughs> in, 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 You're the worst. in thirty percent gray. So uh, ultra light. Uh, ultra light. Yeah. Everything. <laughs> I know. Don't I'm the worst. don't do that. Don't do okay. that. I won't. So do you have okay. another, to, to, to close this up, do you have a, another tip if you want to maybe create um, something, a print style for your website or something, an idea, um, uh, what, what would, would be a beginner's mistake when coming from digital doing print? Maybe, maybe we'll just jump on that last point that you made is that low contrast or that, yeah, that yeah. realizing that when you're in a digital environment, oftentimes the user does have some control certainly over um, the size of the type and and uh, the way the type looks on screen but in print we don't have that luxury so oftentimes when we're thinking about this from through an accessibility lens or even not it's just who how do we make what we put on the printed page valuable readable usable for the greatest number of people the largest audience. And mm -hmm. there's always going to be situations where people need something different. But I mean, that's that's a big one is understanding that we have a lot of power and a lot of like with great power comes great responsibility to choose the right type mm -hmm. because it's <laughs> it's it does have that permanence. And we do have to consider the the population um, that that we we are the ones making that decision and not necessarily the user. So I think that's mm. a big one is is understanding the fundamentals mm -hmm. so that we can apply them for readability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then also the flip side of that is is to know the fundamentals so we can then break the rules and we can yeah. have fun with type and we can we can be expressive and do some cool things that maybe you can't doesn't have the same effect in a digital space mm. so we can i think it goes both ways knowing the fundamentals helps us create better print documents that are long documents that are heavy on type but knowing the fundamentals also allows us to experiment and play and break the rules and know that we can have fun in this medium of print cool Cool. Thanks. So just to um, wrap this up, what would you say, Diana, um, what is your favorite, favorite thing about typography? Why do you think it's so, 
what what fascinates you about it and what mm -hmm. do you think sh other people uh, should benefit from ha having some typographic skills then for me it's everywhere right and so that's the cool thing about type is you like well the space is wild but the, <laughs> i mean you look around and type is everywhere it's yeah, from yeah. the most mundane fundamental mm -hmm. documents that we have to our favorite book that we curl up with or the magazine that arrives in our mailbox and who doesn't love fun mail and that's filled mm -hmm. with type right to the billboards that exist downtown and and you're surrounded in massive typography i mean type is everywhere and oftentimes it's invisible. And I think that mm -hmm. to me is one of the most interesting things is that it's it's everywhere, so we stop seeing it. But if we just open our eyes and kind of observe and see like what works, what doesn't, what do I like, what do I not like, what what mm -hmm. is legible or readable, or like trying to understand the world mm -hmm. around us through mm -hmm. the lens of typography to me mm -hmm. is fascinating. So then also to make sure that you can utilize these uh, things that you've learned and found out and then put them into practice and also that can benefit your projects and ideas. Exactly. And and you also yeah. get to annoy your husband and your family with type knowledge because yes. that's, that's one way to get under their skin is just walk into a bookstore and not stop talking for three hours and they are... They they are pulling their hair out. It's really fun. You should try it sometime. Yeah, yeah, I know. I have my <laughs> wife so far that she can spot bad kerning at times, but yeah. <laughs> but Excellent. actually, the, the yeah, it's good, but it's not that you have a hard life after seeing all that flaws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's bad typography is everywhere as well. Yes. It is, it is, which makes you appreciate good uh, even more. So um, if you, you, you made your, your uh, episode with, yeah, as I already mentioned, this brilliant incomplete history of, of type and which is also going on. So if you only had two typefaces to choose from, what would you rather pick? Would it be Papyrus or Comic Sans? Ugh. <sighs> this is cruel. This I know. Really cruel. Okay, so I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it out there. So I've thrown a lot of hate around, um, and my kids would say hate's a bad word, mom. But I've thrown a lot of hate around for both of these typefaces, and I respect both of these designers. I respect the origin stories of both, but they're also both overused. And anyway, I, yes, there, there's I, I said a lot about both. Yeah. I think I will have to say if I had to choose one or the other. I would choose Comic Sans. And here's why. From an accessibility standpoint, which is very top of mind for the, me these days, as, as you've heard throughout this, yeah, this yeah. chat, it's uh, quite an accessible choice because each letter form is distinct and unique and that the Ds aren't a perfect mirror image of the Bs and so on and so forth. So from an accessibility standpoint, I'll choose Comic Sans, begrudgingly, but I will choose Comic Sans. Fair enough, fair enough. And it's for an invitation at, a, at kindergarten. It might be appropriate then. <laughs> yes, yes. It's on a lot of my, my daughter's worksheets and stuff that she brings home. And I just kind of go, this That's is okay. the time and the place. This, the is, thing this is, is the place yeah, where it's meant. The yeah. thing is, if, if this would be in, uh, in Times New Roman, it would right it, you're it's right it's much more appropriate in comic sense really it definitely is so there is a place for comic sense it definitely is we just have to I find agree. the right one yeah <laughs> definitely <laughs> i agree okay um where can people go to find out more about you and your podcast and and other stuff you're up to yeah so the best place to find me is at talk paper scissors uh, and that's on Instagram. So at mm -hmm. Talk Paper Scissors. And then my website where all of the kind of show notes and additional information with all the episodes and some fun little extras are at talkpaperscissors.info. Talkpaperscissors.info. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm, yeah, I'm really excited to continue to share in that space. It is something that is completely a passion project. It is, it is intertwined with my day job, but it is not my day job. And so it's really yeah. something I do just for fun and to kind of um, um, yeah keep learning and exploring and chatting with cool people like yeah, you in the yeah. in this space so who knows what that will morph into in the future I don't know but that's that's where you can where you can check me out awesome yeah and it's really worth uh, taking a look at because what I absolutely like is your um, passion for details and the uh, at the bottom of the page 
it's such a, su such a fun experience <laughs> to hover on the various images there <laughs> and not knowing where it will lead you from an accessibility and web design point of view. It's horrible, but it's a creative yes, it thing there. <laughs> it is, yeah. And I agree. <laughs> but it's the one thing you re remember. You'll have to find out why you, you connected this image with what. And it, just check it out. Check out the footer at talkpapersisters.info. Easter eggs for everybody, yes. A yeah, few little yeah, fun extras. So, Diana, thanks a lot for joining. Thank you, Oliver. It has been an absolute pleasure to geek out with you on this world of, of type. Thank you. What a delightful conversation this was. So if you do not have enough already of us talking, then head over to talkpaperscissors.info where I had the pleasure to be a guest and Diana asked me about picking and pairing typefaces. Also, if you found this episode helpful, share it with a friend or somebody who might benefit from it. Really much appreciated. If you're thinking now legibility, readability, what's a good typeface for body text? Actually, it doesn't really matter if it's on print or on screen. There's a video for you. You can click right now to get a practical example. Watch out all the other content, subscribe to the newsletter and see you in the next one.